I was addicted to heroin in my in my mid twenties. And I couldn't afford to keep up with it. And I was dating this girl and she was like, we can get on the methadone program. And we were in Manhattan and we were like 25 year old kids basically going to the methadone program. And uh, I did methadone in Manhattan for probably three years. And then I got sober for a millisecond. And then, like I told you, I turned up in LA and it went from meth to the pills in Tijuana to heroin real quick and I and I was totally strung out. Don't hide the scars, a weekly podcast focused on addiction and recovery, created by the nonprofit Pain, parents and addicts in need, and founded by Flint Anderson. Dave from uh the wonderful Dopey Podcast and Community. Thanks for joining founder of Pain, Flint Anderson, myself, Jason on Don't Hide the Scars. Oh, thank you. It's always good to see you, Jason and Flint. Flint seems like a very happy person, so thank you. I'm happy to be here. It's a thrill. <laughs> We're glad you're here, Dave. Um, we really are. I needed to laugh today, that's for sure. Uh, no, I told him, I said, I said you're going to love Dave, and I can't think of a conversation we have that we don't laugh. And it was kind of like, oh, thank God. <laughs> we could have a sense of humor about some of this shit. Yeah, that's, I mean, I find it's just my way of coping. And sometimes it's not the best way of coping. I'm sure it makes my wife insane that I need everything <laughs> to be a joke. All I mean, it's like it's it's an asset and a defect at the same time, <laughs> for sure. But uh, it, it gets me through my life, you know, like if and, and it's gotten me through pretty much every part of my life. I mean, at my worst it was still pretty funny, <laughs> even though it was really horrible. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't resist. So, uh, and that, and that's also the basis for our show. You know, we started our show uh, to laugh about the dumbest and, and mo- we'd say the dumbest shit we ever did. That was like our slogan, uh, you know, dopey on drugs, addiction and dumb shit. But if you, if it, if you were not, you know, one of us, it would be way worse than dumb shit. It would be horrific. It would be awful. It would be just mm-hmm. the worst thing you ever heard. And we, we enjoyed laughing at it, and and that's kind of our shtick, for lack of a better word. Yeah, but I I think we can relate in that a lot of us in recovery, we've got a dark humor about it. I mean, like you said, it's it's it it's coping. I was in a, a classroom, you know, I spoke and kind of told my story. We you know got conversational, and uh, this young lady goes, when you talked about your car accident like where you, where you did it intentionally because you didn't want to live anymore. You were like smirking the whole time. I'm like, in retrospect, it's all I can do about it. It's like it, the reality of yep. like, what was my logic? Oh, there wasn't any freaking logic here. Well, if we don't laugh about it too, at some point we're going to cry about it. I mean, so I, I'd rather laugh than cry. That's for damn sure. Yeah. And I feel like if I had the choice, I would, I think I would choose to laugh and, 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 you know, it's it's weird how connected laughing and crying are. Like, whenever I laugh, like, real hard, I'm crying by the end of it. It's, it's, it's triggering, not like grief, but such a cathartic reaction in my body that tears are coming out of my eyes. And it's, it's wild, you know? And I, I think I, I smirk when I tell those stories, too, because... I don't even know what that's about. Like, I think that's an interesting question right there. Why do we smirk when we tell those stories? I mean, part of it, I I imagine, is it's like, fuck you. I'm going to tell my story and you're not going to judge me and I'm going to smirk at you. And part of it is, is what you said, Flint, like, how can we choose between laughter or crying? Like, that's, that's, that's an interesting thing in itself. It's, it's, it's a crazy, crazy thing. Like, uh, how far we go and then what we're left with, you know, like when I was a kid, I was in, uh, in a math class teacher's name was Mr. Kissack. Shout out to Mr. (laughs) Kissack. If he's listening to the don't hide the scars podcast. Um, he, 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 me and him had some kind of oppositional relationship. And in my school, if you did badly, in the beginning of the quarter, they would send you a one subject report, right? Like to let your parents know that it's not going well. <laughs> and, uh, and he wrote this one subject report about me. And it wasn't about that. I wasn't good at math, which I wasn't. And it wasn't about like 
that I was loud or obnoxious, which I was. It was <laughs> David. It was like something like David disturbs me with his evil smirk. That was the one subject report that when I was in eighth grade, and I'm sure it's similar to your smirk, Jason, when you talk about that car, the car wreck, it's this weird thing that people do not know what to make of that face. It's yeah. fucking weird. I, it. it's fun <laughs> uh, I gotta know. Well, you know, Lynn on the, on, on the podcast, Dave will have on uh, his dad a lot, which I love. But if we ever do go to New York, a, Delhi for sure. B, uh, fuck you. I don't need to meet you. I need to meet your dad. Uh, just kidding. Okay, that's fair. Uh, that's, fair. <laughs> that's fair. But uh, how was like mom, dad response? You and I have not talked much about like childhood Dave, you know? Um, my It's funny because I went to a, a 12 step meeting this morning and the meeting was about, it was a daily reflections meeting and it was all about blame. The daily reflection today is uh, a word to drop blame. And on the show, I will often, well, it's like this. When I became a drug addict or or when my drug addiction was in its height, you know, that question of why, what happened, like, and, and, you know, you go to rehab, what happened to you? And I, I really had a hard time putting together why I was a drug addict. I grew up in a middle-class Jewish uh, family in New York city. My parents were both teachers. Um, when I delve into my, it's like, I'm not I'm, I'm dopey. I love to blame my father for my heroin addiction. <laughs> I think it's funny uh, and it makes him crazy. And, and I think it's also just counter to the fact that when I was coming up as a drug addict, they didn't blame themselves. They blame me like, <laughs> right. and, uh, you know, how dare they blame me? <laughs> but, uh, but like I was raised in like a kind of classic, I, I was born in 1974. Uh, I had two parents in the television set and I think I would, if I could have hugged and kissed the television set, I would have done it. Like I, I was, I had a TV in my room, you know what I mean? Like I, we would have meals together, but I was in my room watching TV like a junkie, you know what I mean? And, uh, and I went to this really, really great school uh, from a very early age. When I was four, I got into it. And my, when I was a kid in elementary school, I remembered my mother would say things like, I'll scrub the floor so you can go to Harvard. And uh, by the time I was in seventh or eighth grade, when I'm getting one subject reports about my evil smirk, it's getting to be kind of clear that I'm not going to Harvard. <laughs> it's not, it's not going to happen. So, um, my 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 mother was very overprotective, uh, very controlling, somewhere between overprotective and controlling. And one of the great statements of my friends, like we I would have friends come home with me all the time and they and they would always say, I, I never want to answer your mother's questions because I know you're going to lie so much that I have no idea what you're going to say. <laughs> and, and, and I just lied so she wouldn't be on my on my head. Right. You know, I lived in Manhattan. I, I grew up in Chelsea. I went to school on the Upper East Side. And she would get annoyed if I if I took a combination of trains and buses home that she didn't think was the right one. So, like, it was like <laughs> it was a lot of control. She, If I dressed a certain way, whatever I was doing, she was she, it wasn't like punishable. It wasn't punitive. It was just a lot of talking at me, a little bit of a lot of, a little bit of criticism. I didn't do well in school. So there was that too. And, um, I think that that impacted my self image. Right. Sure. I mean, like, I don't, I really, I'm not looking to blame anybody except my father. Cause I enjoy it, but I don't <laughs> think it was, I don't think it was really their fault. I think it's a concert of experiences. I don't, I mean, all of my friends, I would say the majority of my friends had parents who really doted on them, who thought everything that they made was this incredible thing. And I didn't have that experience. Um, but that, I mean, that's my childhood. Like it was, it was a great middle-class Jewish childhood in Manhattan. I had two loving parents who definitely did their best. I had an older sister who I was not close with. Um, we had scrapes here and there. And I had a group of friends, like a really intense group of friends. And I would say, like, as I've done 
my own analysis and exploration into my addiction and my psyche or whatever. I think I was codependent way before I was addicted. Like I was, and I was super codependent on this group of friends uh, to the point. And I, and I, like I said, I started that school when I was four. So my group of friends came together at like five, six, and I'm still tight with those guys, yeah. but it fucked me up a bit, you know? New Perceptions North, the premier drug and alcohol treatment and recovery center in Central California. A full continuum of medically supervised top quality care with programs for detox, inpatient residential treatment with dual diagnosis, intensive outpatient treatment, sober living, support groups, and more. With 50 plus years of combined experience and sobriety, Flint Anderson and Thelma Gatlin Wilson provide adult men and women with the highest caliber of professional health care, treating each client with compassion and respect, in a safe, comfortable environment to begin the process of recovery to proudly create and sustain a life without addiction, call 559-978-1507 or visit newperceptionsnorth.com. And I can relate to that. I, I've, yeah. I've said that many a times in self-examination. I was an addict before I was an addict. And I can just see it from the behavior. And as we talked about, you know, the porn exposure at an early age and it, it it was just it was just a combination of things of perfect recipes. Mm -hmm. I mean, Jesus, you know, perfect Flint, storm. Flint, you waking up, uh, you know, being born and going right into surgery yeah. and and you know, surgeries for God was it seventeen years straight? You know, um, thir thir uh, for surgery. What? Um, I was born with an ailment that um, that caused me to. I had to have us go right back. I was born, bam, back in the operating room. Um, and it had to do with my bladder and urethra and those kinds of things. And, and so they had to go in once a year, uh, for the first 13 years to, to repair the, the my insides. Mm -hmm. And then I had four more surgeries in 76. That was all in one year. Uh, so I was basically in the hospital for the entire year of 1976. Um, and then I've had, wow. I think, I think I've had like 17 or 18 cents then along with a couple heart attacks and a couple open heart surgeries and shoulder surgeries and knee surgeries and all that nonsense. I think I've had, I, I've, hell Dave, I've lost count. I think it's 34, <laughs> you know, all together, but I have to have a couple more. Um, so yeah, talk about, you know, moms that, you know, that, I mean, first of all, doted on my ass, you know, the, the entire time. Um, but I was also on an opioid for, for, you know, short periods of time uh, during that. So my opioid receptors were fucked up from day one. Um, right. That's interesting. Yeah. I, I mean, just, you know, looking, looking back, um, it was again, uh, both my parents were teachers as well. And, um, you know, but, but because of those surgeries and my dad had to work like, you know, three different jobs because, you know, on a teacher salary, you know, back in the fifties and sixties, I mean, that was, that was just crap. Um, yeah. So he had to do that. My mom stayed home. Um, but God, I was always being taken to that fucking doctor for something. I mean, I've got this, this love of this love, hate affair with, with doctors. I, I, I really do, you know, um, cause when, when, when I was using in the height of my using, I was doctor shopping, you know, this is back in the, in the eighties and nineties, um, that, you know, doctors were just writing scripts like there was no tomorrow. And hell, I, I would make friends with these with these doctors. Of course. Why wouldn't you? Right. <laughs> right. I mean, I was I was in the produce business for a while. I'd take them over. I'd take them over dried fruit or I'd take them over, you know, grapes and, you know, those those kinds of things. The hell, golf doc. <laughs> hell yeah. I knew where these guys lived, for Christ's sake. Um, yeah, it was, it was pretty interesting, to say the least. Yeah. I didn't have to make appointments. I just walked fucking in there, you know, and yeah. Was there, was there like any kind of cantaloupe for Delauded? system <laughs> <laughs> Delauder was too short acting i i, I wanted i wanted the longer lasting stuff you know so what was um, your what was your what was your thing it was well any opioid to be you know to be honest with you but w when when vicodin hit the market that 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 was it and then of course i discovered you know some other like lortab the things that would take up to 10 milligrams or, or more um Right. The, the last two years of my using, that's that's really the whew, shit. I mean, I was taking between 70 and 80 every day. You know, it yeah. was. Yeah, it was it was nuts. And if there were more, I I, I would have taken more. Um, you know, we did it. We did a podcast with Skinny Vinny one time and and, and he was even talking about doing it, doing a, a, a cartoon or something on this. So I got to tell Dave the story. So 
I'm I'm going into my last treatment center in in 2001, right? And for all those years, Dave, I don't know why, but I would take the, the empty pill bottles. <laughs> I I never wanted to throw them in the garbage can because God forbid my family should find out I'm a drug addict, you know. So right, right. <laughs> right. so I put them in a 33 gallon hefty garbage bag, and then oh I my put, God. then I put them in the rafters in my garage thinking someday I'll take them to the dump <laughs> or I'll bury them. Right. This is that, you know, our thinking, right. So, so before I'm going into treatment and nobody wanted anything to do with my ass at, at that time, my brother-in-law's decided that my mother-in-law was going to move in with us because she wasn't bad enough for, for, you know, for you know, adult care, whatever it was. So I lived in a house that the garage side was on the side street. So they decided while I'm in treatment, they're going to knock that thing down and they're going to build a mother-in-law suite there. Oh, so, boy. Oh, yeah. Here we go. <laughs> so so I'm down. I'm down at the Betty Ford Center. Right. And I call home like on the 10th day. And again, why? I couldn't tell you because nobody wanted to talk to me. And and my wife, who does not swear, she she, she simply said this. We found your fucking pill bottles. And I just went, oh, shit. So when the construction guys went in there and knocked everything down, four 33-gallon garbage bags stuffed with empty pill bottles came crashing down on the workers' heads. We figured oh, no, there was- you're saying, you're saying four giant garbage bags full of pill bottles. And wouldn't it have been easier if you just threw them in the garbage one at a time? Yes. The evidence, yes. The yes. evidence is, is staggering. Yes, the evidence. Well, how do I talk my ass out of this one? Okay. I, I, I. By the way, that didn't count the ones I threw out the window, you know, after I picked them right. up from the pharmacy or, you know, wherever. So, yeah, we figured there were somewhere between seven and 8,000 empty bottles that came crashing down. That's amazing. Did you get clean after that, though? I did. See that? I mean, that's a bottom though. You find fucking thousands of pill bottles. It's like, there's no fucking around with what's actually happening. Like yeah. nobody can be like, Oh, I found a bottle of Vicodin. It's like, no, I found 4,000 bottles. <laughs> right, 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 right. right. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I mean, it was, yeah, I, I managed to stay clean. Uh, I got clean in March 5th, 2001. Awesome story though. That's amazing. I love that story because I think it really helped you. Yeah. But see, but that goes back to what we can either laugh or cry about it because I tell that story and I make it funny because it is kind of funny. Oh, it's fucking hilarious. And, 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 you know, because it's the audacity of our where our brains are at that, like, the best plan for this is to put them in the rafters. Right. Well, the, but the, fu the, the fucked up thing, it's something that me and my, my, ho my friend who I hosted Dopey with who died would always say is we laughed the survivors laugh, meaning Ooh. because you survived that shit is fucking funny. But if it was, if I died and my father found that four bags of, uh, of, of pill bottles, it wouldn't be a funny story. It would be all oh, my dad's right. son had left 4,000 pill bottles, but because you survived, it is funny. It's crazy though. I mean, it's like, and I'm not trying to bring you down, but I think that's the difference between comedy and tragedy that you lived. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. It is. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it could be, it could be the same thing like Jason was alluding to earlier when I used to, you know, I had a legal support service business where we serve summons and complaints and kick out orders and subpoenas and all that stuff. And I'd tell my family I had to go to, cause we're about four hours from LA. I'd have to go to LA to serve subpoenas. And I'd just and I'd head right right to the to the Mexican border, you know, and this is all pre 9-11 stuff. And I'd stick yeah. a nine mil nine millimeter behind my pants. I'd walk across the border. I'd load up my pockets, come back across the border. Didn't care if I got shot. Didn't care if I got killed. Just just didn't care because I had to get those drugs. You know, if I if, if I literally couldn't get anything around locally, then that's that that's where I'd go and do it. And I survived every one of those damn things. And I, you know, again, just by the grace of God that I that I survived. Yeah. Did you need to use the gun when you went down there for anything? No, 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 absolutely not. Never, never, never once. But but I but I never knew, you know, was I gonna wind up getting arrested somewhere, walking out of a pharmacia, you know, uh, because I was not going to a Mexican jail. There, there 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 was just there was just no way. Well again, you but you got lucky. 
with that. Yeah, I did. Are you kidding me? And and uh, I mean, with Mexico, I mean, fucking Tijuana. Like, I only went to Tijuana maybe twice or something. And it, I, I maybe I went when I was a kid too. But that place is like the greatest place for a drug addict. It is. It is the greatest thing ever. Right. Uh, I was so I was so happy. I remember I went down there with with a friend of mine, and uh, and I had I just gotten out of rehab, and I moved to Los Angeles from Delray Beach. By you know I'm from New York. I, I got sent to Delray to get sober. They sure. I lost my apartment in Manhattan, and I moved to Los Angeles. And, uh, and I moved in with two friends who I always, who I used a ton of drugs with. And they were like, well, Dave's not doing heroin, so we can't do heroin. And they were still smoking pot. And then one of them didn't realize that the other had started, uh, smoking meth. Also. Oh, so when I got there, when I got there, he was like 14 days into his first meth run or something. And I was like, oh. all right, I'll, if I'm not, you know, I'll, I'll smoke meth. So I started smoking meth with this guy. And I was like, you know what I could really go for? <laughs> and they're like, they're like, you know, I could really go for anything besides this. You know what I mean? And I was like, I do. I was like, isn't T isn't isn't Tijuana just a few hours south? And aren't there drug stores where we can buy stuff to make us feel the opposite of this horrible drug that we're doing? <laughs> and uh, they're like, yeah. So we went down there and bought everything. I mean, they I don't think they sold like oxycotton. No, like that's what I and and I never I didn't get to do much oxycotton in my drug using career, but I was hoping I could buy wall to wall oxycotton. But we bought every benzo and every every opioid that they had, and we didn't bring a pistol. I know that if we had brought a pistol, it would have been over before it started. You know, <laughs> we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have survived that shit. But um, man, it's so funny. Like I was at a meeting today, um, and I'm sitting next to this older man. He's probably thirty years sober. Uh, and he was a heroin addict and uh, somebody was talking about like, like how you need as a drug addict or an alcoholic, when you travel or, or in your life, you need to learn how to assimilate into other cultures and, and, and meaning like a 12 step meeting or another country or whatever. And, uh, and the guy sitting next to me, he's like, he goes, he goes, last time I left the country, I had a box of methadone with me. <laughs> and, uh, and when I heard him say that, I was like, I, I was like, I smiled. Like you tell the Tijuana story, and I'm like, oh yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> and he tells me that he had a box of methadone. And I'm like, I haven't done heroin in a long time, but still, I was comforted by the fact that when he left the country, he had a box of methadone. <laughs> right. <Okay. laughs> right. And it's like, when is that reaction going to change? Like I don't know. It's been a long time since I, you know. But it's funny to me. What were you going to say, Jason? I'm sorry. For I was going to ask you about, you know, your bottom. And once you started to get help, I don't think I've ever just bullshitting with you asked, did you go through medically assisted treatment and kind of a process? Because I know you don't touch anything now, but was that kind of part of your process too? Suboxone, methadone? I mean, because to let people know, I mean, heroin was going to be the downfall, correct? Yeah, I mean, I was uh, I was very much addicted to heroin. For a long time, probably 11 or 12 years thereabouts, I was addicted. I was I, I smoked weed every day for like 20 years. I, I was terribly addicted to benzodiazepines, yeah. like bad, uh, ate them every day, had many, many, many seizures. It was right. it was a real thing. Uh, methadone was totally a huge part of my story for better and mostly for worse, though. You know, like uh, I, yep. I was addicted to heroin in my in my mid 20s and I couldn't afford to keep up with it. And I was dating this girl and she was like, we can get on the methadone program. And we were in Manhattan and we were like 25 year old kids basically going to the methadone program. And uh, I did methadone in Manhattan for probably three years. And then I got sober for a millisecond. And then, like I told you, I turned up in L.A., and it went from meth to the pills in Tijuana to heroin real quick. And I and I was totally strung out in Los Angeles. And I made even less money in Los Angeles than I made in Manhattan. So I quickly found the methadone program. And I was on, uh, I think I was on methadone in, in Los Angeles for six and a half years. Uh, and I got up to 150 milligrams oh, of yeah. methadone. It was bananas. It was like fucking, it was... It was it was horrible. And I, I mean, I was just talking about that recently, too. I, I would and because I didn't use it correctly, you know, and when I got sober, 
I would shit on uh, medical assisted treatment because I never did it properly. I did medical assisted treatment because I couldn't afford heroin, um, but I didn't want to stop using it. I would wake up at four or five in the morning in Los Angeles, go to downtown LA or go to, um, you know, a, a, a couple of, I don't even remember exits past it. And I would buy heroin, you know, before the stores opened, which I loved. It was like, it was like, I loved that scene. And uh, it was, you know, that's how sick I am. That's why I have a podcast called Dopey because I loved it. I loved copping in downtown before the sun came up when it felt safe. Um, and I would, I'd spend whatever money I had and I'd get high and then I'd get methadone. And I, I did that for years and years. And uh, with, I didn't do Suboxone very long. I, I, when I, I moved back to New York and uh, I got sober again. Uh, but again, just for a second, like I got off, I, I, I kicked methadone for a year. I did the blind taper for a year in Los Angeles. Um, and I, when I got off methadone, man, holy cow, was I excited? Like, yeah. I didn't know that I didn't know how I'd get off. I didn't know. And I, and I, listen, I know people that are, that use methadone the correct way and they have amazing lives. And I know tons of people who use Suboxone. And, and they seemed to have amazing lives, but I was so excited because I felt like I was in quicksand and I was up to my chin in that methadone. And I didn't see that I was going to get out. I only got out because my mother got leukemia and my mother got leukemia and she was in Manhattan and I was in Los Angeles. And when she told me, <clears throat> excuse me, that she thought she was going to die, I just, something changed in me where I was just like, I was such a fucking waste uh, in Los Angeles. I had a girlfriend. Uh, I didn't have a job. I didn't work there for like seven years. I don't think we had sex in that same period of time. I just did methadone. I shot heroin. I took right. pills. And when my mother told me she was dying and I was, I, I would literally wander around the neighborhood of Echo Park in a bathrobe taking out of focus pictures of flowers. Uh, that's what I did. I thought I was an artist. You know what I mean? When I found 50 cents, I would buy an ice cream sandwich and I would eat it. And then I would find another 50 cents and I'd buy another one. And that was my life wandering around Echo Park, like a crazy person. Wow. Um, so when I found out my mother was dying, I, um, I, I, I went to the methadone clinic and I knew I couldn't just get off of it, but they offered this blind taper. And, um, and I used the whole time. Like I, I, I had it set up where I knew when they piss tested me that yep. I would, I would, I would give it three days because heroin gets out of your system so quickly. I would use like, you know, Friday, I think they piss tested on Thursday. So I would use, uh, Thursday after the piss test, mm -hmm. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then Monday, maybe, I, maybe Monday. And then Tuesday and Wednesday, I would drink a ton of water and Thursday I would piss clean and it worked. Like, and I, and they, they lowered my dose. They gave me take homes. And when I got to, back to the city, to Manhattan, I, I was off of everything except weed. And then I wound up getting back on heroin and I didn't want, I, ref, I didn't want to go back to methadone, but I found a doctor who was prescribing me Suboxone. And I, I, I was on it so briefly because, uh, I, it, I just knew it wasn't going to work for me. You know, I, I, it's a long answer to your question, but that's, I don't, I didn't have any successful medically assisted treatment. Although Chris, when I used to make fun of people who were on methadone and Suboxone on Dopey, because I always used, I would buy pills at the methadone clinic. I'd buy heroin yeah. at the methadone clinic. I would buy Coke at the methadone clinic. I would smoke weed at the methadone clinic. And when we would talk about it, I would be like, you're not getting clean. It's bullshit. You just can't afford the heroin. Cause I couldn't. So like I, I, but my, my opinion changed because our audience was full of people who had successful experiences. But what Chris also would always say is, well, you're sober now and methadone is part of your story. So how can you not think that maybe the medically assisted treatment did have a piece of your recovery? And I think it did. You know, I think my experience on methadone was, was incredibly powerful. <laughs> you know, it was crazy. <laughs> Uh, I hear my knees clicking. My knees click at <laughs> night sometimes, and I'm like, "Oh, that's the method." <laughs> <You know? laughs> saying, saying hello after all these years. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I thank you for sharing because you know we. I, I mean, Flint, two years on it, and you know, I mean, you could tell, but we we 
we talk with so many people and we just want them to understand both sides of it. Like no matter what, there's consequences, like you're saying, you know, there's those potential things. And, and Flynn, I mean, Jesus, you see it around here so much of, of uh, you know, because you were there and you did it of uh, people going to the clinic and much like you buying and not yeah. really kicking. So it's, you know, it's one of our concerns about this, the proper way to go about it. And it's, it, I don't know, maybe it's a crapshoot. I don't know. I don't know. Well, I look, I, I think a, cu- a couple of things here. Um, first of all, Methadone to me is the devil's drug. I, I, I mean, I went through psychotic breaks with it, trying to trying to kick it on my own. Um, you know, again, you could like you, Dave. I mean, I bought other drugs sitting right there in the parking lot. Um, you know, it, it's and and so what I had to do, and I wish these places would just call themselves maintenance centers, you know, a, a, instead of treatment centers, because to me, and again, this is just my personal opinion, they're 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 not providing treatment at all. They're they're doctors will if you walk in, you say, hey, my dose isn't holding me. They'll say, OK, well, let's let's up that thing. And by the way, they started me at one hundred and ninety milligrams. That's the top Shut legal up. dose. I'm not kidding you. One hundred ninety. I was falling. Asleep. I fell asleep at a traffic light in downtown yeah, Fresno. Yeah, you know, yeah, I, yeah. I, I mean, I and it you. and it and it took me two years. And I finally walked in there with my box of take homes. And I can't remember what what day it was, but I walked in and I said, "Let me tell you something, gang." I said, "You can take this box and you can shove it up your ass." I said, "Because I'm done." I took it all the way down to where you couldn't even see pink in the bottle anymore. It was it was water. You know, and I said, you can keep the box. You can keep, you can keep this. They said, well, you owe us, I don't know, 350 bucks. I said, find my ass. Okay. Cause I'm not giving that to you either. And I, and I, and I turned around and walked out, you know, and, and look, I, I think methadone has its place. If, if it's a, a 60 year old and up and they're a street person and they want to stay off heroin, then, then, then I think it serves its purpose. And, but for both of on a methadone, why, why do we want to put a 24 year old on this and strap them to this? It just takes so long to even try to get off of this stuff. And you know, as well as I, Dave, just like the story you told about the guy with the box of methadone going to Europe, you know, you can't even go outside of your area if you forget your methadone. You know, if you're living in Long Island, you can't go unless it's different in New York, but I don't think so. You live in Long Island. You go to Manhattan for the day and, and, and you forgot your methadone. And now the methadone clinic in Long Island's closed. You can't walk into another another treatment facility in Manhattan and get it. So you're fucked for, for the next 24 hours. You want to hear a really crazy methadone story? Yeah. Yes. Um, which was, uh, it was 9-11 you know, in 2001 oh, God. and I was living in Manhattan and, uh, and I was on methadone and, uh, I, I, I wake up late. My parents were in California. They called me and they were like, I didn't even know what was happening. They were like, Oh, the world trade center is, is falling. And I, I was supposed to check on my sister and my aunt and I did, but all I really wanted to figure out was how was I going to get methadone? And, and then what was I going to do? And uh, I lived on 24th Street and 8th Avenue, and I left my apartment building, and the streets were panicked. Everyone was running north up 8th Avenue, and my methadone clinic was on 13th Street, so I had to walk south. Everyone's running the opposite direction, and I'm strolling, like not really understanding what's happening, except I need to get my methadone. That's all I could think. Yes, the World Trade Center was falling down. Uh, yes, we were potentially at war in New York city. My home was being attacked, but like, I didn't, I I want to get sick. You know, what the fuck was I going to do? I walk down eighth Avenue, like a, a salmon swimming upstream, you know, thousands of people coming up eighth Avenue and I get to 14th street and there's uh tanks on 14th street and there's troop trucks and there's uh army personnel with machine guns like that. You know what I mean? And I get to 14th street and I'm like, and my my methadone clinic's on 13th Street. And I, I said to the guy, I said, I got to get across the street. He's like, do you see we're here? The tanks, the troop trucks? And I was like, no, 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 no. I'm sick. I got to <laughs> right. get across the street. And he's like, what do you mean? And I was like, well, I have to get my methadone. And he's like, well, do you have any ID? And I'm like, absolutely. <laughs> you know, I take out my methadone card. I show my card. 
he literally waves me across the street with his machine gun. He's like, oh, wow. of course, sir. You know, membership has its privileges. <laughs> he, waves me, <laughs> he waves me across the street and I get to the methadone clinic and in the methadone clinic, it's business as usual. It's 1979. You know right. what I mean? It's like, you know, and, and it's it's like, and, and no, but I mean, I agree with what you said. The thing that really freaks me out as a sober person who cares about addicts, like I, I really care about addicts a lot. And I know, I mean, I know so many people that are on these prolonged Suboxone uh, prescriptions and I don't want to be like, that's not the way to do it. Like, I don't want to tell anybody that they're not doing it the right way or whatever. But what I really hate more than anything is that they don't even have a dosage under 0.5 or something. Right. They're like everybody that, you know, when they're trying to get off Suboxone, the doctor's like, you have to cut the strip. You have to cut the pill. You have to crush it up a little. It's like, what kind of fucking racket is it? that they right. can't have a 0.4, a 0.3, a 0.2, a 0.1, a 0.09. Let these people get off because the psychological component yes. is massive. And if they did that, it would be a really bene a, 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 a beneficent, a, you know what I mean? It would be a nice move for drug addicts and to keep them snipping fucking Suboxone film and cutting up method or uh, Suboxone pills. It's like fucking crazy. Like to me that at this point, it's like 20 years of Suboxone use like that. And nobody can get down off two milligrams or something. It's nuts. I agree. I agree hundred percent with you. Dave. totally agree with you on that one. Yeah. But I feel bad also. Don't you, what, what are you going to say? You're going to say this is a good opinion, right, Jason? Uh, exactly. Yeah, right? I, I said, yeah. I don't think I've heard it quite, quite put I so either. well in that regard. Right? That was perfect. Cause uh, well, you know, this is, my only, this is the way. only good point. The only good point I have is, is that the, is that Suboxone <laughs> dosages have to be, they have to have pills that are lower because nobody's getting off. Do you know how I mean? It's like a traffic jam and everyone's stuck. And it's also like, listen, it's like, it's easy for me to say with my, with my clean time, how everyone should do anything. And that's why I, I, I stop myself because I know, you know, I mean, we know people that are, that are on Suboxone and, what if they weren't on the Suboxone and they were on dope and they were dying of fentanyl? You know what I mean? Like, well, I mean, like, I, I mean, on one hand, it keeps you in and out where the potential of you doing fentanyl is greater. And on the other hand, maybe it keeps you from doing fentanyl. It's something that needs to be examined in a way that it isn't being examined. That's for sure. If you or a loved one is struggling with addiction, please call Parents and Addicts in Need at 559-579-1551 or check us out online at painnonprofit.org. Follow us on social media at Pain Nonprofit. Please subscribe to the podcast and share with others wherever you get podcasts and on YouTube. To donate, please click the link in the description and help us save more lives gripped by addiction. Flint, uh, Dave referred to Chris as his co-host when he started. And I mean, you had shared, I don't remember if it was something we recorded or just conversationally that, uh, you know, his curiosity when he got injured and was on pills, but that curiosity for what is that fentanyl high was part of what brought him back mm -hmm. out there. And I don't know me. I'm just a guy. I know I can't have a chink in the armor, you know? Yep. I, I, I just can't. Yeah. I mean, with, with Chris, like it's very hard to know what the hell happened. You know what I mean? Like you can do a play by play. It's it's like, it's like we were talking about before, like uh, the, the 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 Vicodin bottle story is such a perfect story for where comedy and tragedy cross paths. Like I had another friend named Todd who um who was the guy in LA who was the guy who was smoking meth in LA. And he was a a, a friend of mine from freshman year of college and and you know one of my very best friends and and we became addicted to heroin together and he lived with me in Manhattan and and and, and I lived with him in California and we went back and forth and uh he wound up being on, he was the only person I would have on Dopey that was using because he was one of my oldest friends and he was funny. And, 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 and my experiences with him very much shaped the philosophy around Dopey. And he had a million stories that were like horribly tragic, but they were funny because he survived. In the end, he died. He died and uh, they found him naked in his, in his, his childhood bedroom in his parents' house. They couldn't find the drugs 
you know, like he probably sniffed two bags in his car or something, threw it in the garbage outside, went upstairs and died. And if he hadn't died, it would have been a funny story somehow, but right. because he did, it, it isn't a funny story. And, um, and he couldn't stop. And with Chris, like, we don't know, like, we don't, I don't know what happened with Todd. That's me postulating. Like I imagine him getting out of the car with two bags of, of dope. That was actually fentanyl and him sniffing them and going inside. He didn't even shoot, shoot drugs. Chris, when we would do the show would talk about how lucky we were to have missed fentanyl. Mm -hmm. And I could kind of hear it in the back, back of his throat that he wished he had experienced it. Chris was somebody who was so experienced in every aspect of addiction and recovery. He had been to 15 treatment centers. He had smoked crack since he was 14 or something. He came for money. Uh, he, he was getting his PhD in psychology when he died. He was working in a sober house. He was a sober companion. He knew the system. And when he died, um, they found a bag of drugs in the trunk of his car, like a, like a gallon Ziploc kind of bag with, with drugs, with cigarettes, with fucking latex gloves. He was that careful about not getting found out for smoking that he, I mean, like, it was like, it was like a really mindful relapse that killed him. Um, and the night before he died, they drug tested him and the, the results were going to come back the next day. And if he had tested positive, he would have had to go to treatment and, and whatever, but he didn't make it to the next day. So I'm not curious about fentanyl. You know, I, I'm really not right. like, I don't care. Like, I, I feel like I got very high on heroin. Like, you know, I, 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 one of the things that really hit me hard when I got sober early in my sobriety, I remember I was sitting in a 12 step meeting and I was thinking about how much I love to get high. Uh, but I was also thinking about how I had I hadn't been as high as I had used to have been in a long time, and I kind of was like, I'm never going to get that high again. So like, what am I really doing? So I don't think I also like I have two kids. Like I do not want to disturb any any anything that I've built up at this point to feel something that I know is so fleeting as high. I just I'm not right. I'm just not interested. Right. Yeah. Well put. Although, although I am a little bit, I, I do miss, I miss smoking cigarettes and I miss smoking weed. Like, um, I miss, I loved weed. I loved being <laughs> a stoner. Like I, and I have a reservation around weed. Like I wouldn't mind being an old man on my porch, like in a rocking chair, <laughs> listening to the Almond brothers and smoking bonnets. Like that's something that's in the back. That's just in the back of my head and I can't really get rid of it. It's, but it's a reservation. It's down the road. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was expecting the grateful dead stuff, you know, uh, now, either way. I, I just, I would, I, I have that weird reservation, you know, and as long as it's just a reservation and it's down the road, it's not the end of the world. I don't think. Nope. It's yeah. not. Oh, I, I, uh, yeah, I have those thoughts that I have to push off that like, oh, you know, when, when my kids are grown up and out of the house and the little lady and I are on vacation and sitting on the beach, you know, gosh, it might be uh, nice to order a Mai Tai. And then I have to remind myself, I order a Mai Tai that day, then I disappear next week. You know, it's just how it goes for me. You know, mm -hmm. I got to play it out. Exactly. If, if I smoke, if I smoke a bong hit, my life is just bong hits. Like there is no other life. Like, right. and that's the thing. It's like, it's like we can do anything we want or we can do drugs and drink, but you can't do both. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I kind of like life, e even the shitty stuff, you know, cause Hey, I'm here to experience it. And you know, that's all I am. A human having a human experience. Wow, it's 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 a it's a it's a crazy and wonderful thing, right? Life is a crazy and wonderful thing, and sometimes it's not as good as we want it to be. But I mean, like, I I do mostly really enjoy it. Yeah. Oh yeah. God, I do. I do. I mean, this has been just a wild ride. I I, I mean, it's like I, I I told my wife on my on my headstone, I'm going to put at least I wasn't boring, you know, <laughs> thing, because there's nothing worse than being bored. You know, and I, I mean, th this is meant to 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 laugh, to cry, to up and down. And I mean, that that that's what life is. 
And, you know, I, I'm definitely in the fourth quarter, you know, at, at, at this point, but hell, I'm having more fun now than, than I've ever had before, seriously, or at least people used to tell me I had a great time. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I hang out with a group of guys that are about 10 years younger than I am at our, at our golf club, you know, and, and these guys, they, st they still drink. There's a few of them that's that, that smoke pot and um, hell I'm everybody's sober driver you know, um, I, you know, I'll walk in there. I'll walk into the clubhouse, into the grill room after. And if I had a shitty round, right, I'll, I'll, and the guys will be in there and I'll walk by the bar and I'll go, yeah, you know what, Jason, get me a Jack and Coke. And all of a sudden you hear 30 guys go, no, okay. <laughs> they just, they just, they got my back as much as I've got theirs. I mean, it's, it's, it's really fun. You know, it's really fun. Cause now I'm all about some fun. I'm with you hundred percent. Uh, Dave, you, you haven't written a book, right? No, way to, Why way to rub it in my face, Jason. Well, I, I'm actually uh, trying to, cause him like, you know, uh, yeah, Dave, maybe we should collaborate on a book together, <laughs> man. I, I, I've, I've written a bunch of, uh, I, I've been trying to, to put something together. Like, uh, like this, like that, there's a podcast called this American life. And they did this big piece yeah. about dopey and it was, it was very big for us um and i got a bunch of offers for a book at that point and i started writing and i have like 80 pages um but i don't love it and i just eventually i'll get back to it i'm working on so many things eventually i'll do it like i want to do it i want to i want to write a book but i want it to be good i want it to be funny i want it you know i want it to i want it to to be good basically yeah yeah Let's talk about the building. What about of you? You don't want you yeah. don't want to write a book, Jason. You don't. You're not interested. <laughs> Flint is waiting. He's balking like me. I, yeah, <laughs> I, I think I still kind of uh, struggle sometimes with the imposter syndrome, and I'll tell myself things like, "Oh, it was it was just alcohol, and you know, and pornography mixed in there," which is is is. is evading our youth more than anyone now and i and so i kind of got a i don't know it's it's still some of my isms you know I, i'm still can be so damn self-deprecating all the damn time you know i felt like I, I had four people alone yesterday man loving what you're doing with the podcasts and it's amazing that you've working with an awesome organization keep it up keep going and, and i'm like well yeah it's it's great to be with a, an organization and boy my, you know and my guest and it's like my one of my best friends goes motherfucker can you just take a compliment and say thank you <laughs> and realize right. you're bringing some value so I still struggle with that it's still part of my isms and then you know talking with Flint as I've gotten almost out, most of the stories or a lot of the stories I'm like yeah mine wouldn't be that interesting so it's a lot of that you know outward horse shit that I tell myself that I got to continue to work on. Yeah. And, and that's part of the, no. I think I was an addict before I was an addict. That stuff goes way back to four years old. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think that writing also is a, it's a practice, you know, it it, it's something that you, you need to practice like, like anything else. You, you don't just, you're just not good at it because you want to be good at it. Uh, I, I I've talked to a lot of people about writing and I'm reading so many books just just to deal with the guests on dopey um that i uh you know what people tell me because i can speak i can tell stories people tell me i should try to do dictation software but i don't want to do that i want to write I, I just had this guest on dopey which i think i would like to hook up with you guys uh she was looking for more platforms and she wrote this book called uh her name is Mary Beth O'Connor, and she wrote a book called From Junkie to Judge. And mm, she was an yeah. IV meth addict in um, from New Jersey, but she wound up in, in California. Yep. And her book is amazing. You know her? I don't know her, but I know of her. Yeah, I mean, I'll hook you guys up with her. And she, she's an incredible storyteller and just has an incredible story. Yeah. And I, I just want to get better at it. I just want to get better at, I, I want to try, I, I, you know, I, I still work at cats is full time. I, I, I am so committed to dopey. It's not even funny. Like I am fucking so in it. I have two kids. I have a wife. It's hard. It's hard to do everything I want to do, you know? 
So yeah. I, I try, I try, I try. I want, I mean, Jason, I appreciate that question. I want to have a book. Like I, I'm also working on this. There's, there's, um, it's very exciting, but it's also one of those things where I'm trying to manage my expectations where uh, time magazine like does documentaries and they're doing uh we're in, we're working on a dopey documentary, like a sizzle reel about dopey. And I'm putting a lot of effort into that at the moment. And it's like, you know, it's all expectations and whatever. And writing, writing isn't like talking and it isn't like making stuff like, like we make stuff like this. It's sitting by yourself in a right. room at your computer, plowing the fucking fields and doing it. Although Flint, if you're really interested in writing, the book to read or listen to is Stephen King on writing. Mm. It is because it's also like it's also like an addiction right. memoir. He's an alcoholic in recovery. Right. It's right. really, really great. I should listen to it again. It's and really great. It's called Stephen King on writing. Yeah, it's called on writing, and it's by okay. Stephen King. Okay, on writing. Okay. Yeah. Boy, what a great conversation he beat. I've tried to talk. I've tried through every damn publicist for that guy. It's like he is, uh, you know, <laughs> no. Good luck with that one. But it's it, eventually you'll get him. Eventually, you know what I mean. Like you just you have to never stop and not let rejection make you right. crazy, which is which is not an easy thing to do. It's a skill right. in itself. Yeah. Right. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, you and I both know with a lot of the people we've talked to that rejection thing is, yeah, it's just a part of life. Yeah. And I think it's uh, important to be able to handle it in any aspect. It's different with, with this though, because I feel like with podcasting, it's this medium that was invented super democratically. If you can, I mean, like we recorded the first 50 episodes of Dopey without a mic. We didn't have gear. Like if you, all you need right. to do is find a way to record something and then you have a podcast and then you have all of these people that are the highest uh, ilk of their world. And it's like, we're trying to get them in our world. And back in the day, that wasn't even a thing. You know what I mean? It wasn't like, come to my apartment and you can record me talking to you on a tape recorder. Like that wasn't a thing. It's right. like be on my podcast is this weird thing that everybody who's notable gets asked. And then when you're making a podcast, you're like, well, my, pa my podcast is special or my podcast is this. And then it's like, I'm special. Don't you see that I'm special? And it fucks you up. You know what right. I mean? Like eventually I, I, I finally unfollowed Courtney love. Like it was a huge <laughs> moment in my life to unfollow <laughs> fucking Courtney love. Uh, because like trying to get her on the show was just, it just got to a place of, of like, I need to stop following this person. Yeah. So I, I was very freeing. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing moment <laughs> in my life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I stuck with it for one individual for two years, but uh, the community, that's one of the things I really want to bring up that you do an amazing job that Flint's established here. I mean, geez, you, you know, you, you offered, you know, zoom meetings and, and really with the merchandise, it's, it's become a lifestyle and, you know, Flint, we've really trying to push more of the, the don't hide the scars is a lifestyle. It's about that vulnerability going into the room, telling your story, mm -hmm. being open, being honest. Yeah, with with Dopey, like it was uh, it was not planned. You know, the community was not a planned thing at all. And the lifestyle was was certainly not a planned thing. Like uh, it started as a joke. You know, really, it was like, uh, I mean, I remember I was with Chris and we were recording the show. And I I, I think, you know, you imagine like those preachers at, a, you know, at a Narcotics Anonymous meeting or a church or, or wherever. And they're like, stay strong, you know, stay strong. And I and I said that and I said, dopey nation, stay strong. And it was a joke. You know, it was a joke. Mm -hmm. um, and then Chris needed to say toodles. Uh, at the end of every show, because Chris was very savvy, even though he was an idiot, he was very <laughs> savvy at the same time. And he knew that by saying toodles created the signature sign off for him. Mm -hmm. And then I hated that he said toodles. So he enjoyed annoying me with his toodles. So he would say, I would say, stay strong, dopey nation. And then he would say toodles. 
And I would be like, you don't have to say toodles. And that, and that was <laughs> like how the dopey nation kind of started. And then after he died, um, a couple of fans were like, can we make a fan page called the dopey nation on Facebook? And I, and I was like, okay. And it was really a few, I think it started with a few people and it, and it grew and it was basically a place to mourn Chris more than anything else. Mm -hmm. And it grew and it grew. And now I think it's, uh, it's like 10,000 people. And, uh, they, they started doing dopey zoom meetings. We didn't, they did. They mm -hmm. started doing dopey zoom meetings during COVID. They, they created the dopey nation zoom. And now they do 26 Zoom meetings a week. Wow. And I and I have nothing, I have nothing to do with it. Nothing <laughs> at all to do with it. I, I just and then like and the Zoom meetings aren't about the show. The Zoom right. meetings are about them. You know, it's about them. They just they really identified with with the comedy aspect, the making fun of aspect, and they loved Chris and and then they mourned him together. And that's where it came from. Uh and then like Chris and I very early on, we had a tattoo artist on the show and we were like, would you give uh, a dopey nation member a, a tattoo if we pay for it? And he was like, sure, whatever. So we gave somebody a tattoo. Somebody volunteered to get a tattoo. And then over the years, like 30 other people got dopey tattoos unrelated. And uh, that was the coolest thing for me. Um I don't have any tattoos, but I still encourage everybody to get dopey tattoos. Um, Cause I think it's so, it's like that blows my mind, you know? And like, um, but the meetings and then we do dopey con and right. you guys should come to dopey con and go to cats is catered dopey con last year. Flight. Really? I, well, I had two I'm meat there. cutters cutting, cutting, cutting pastrami at dopey. Oh, con. oh God. That's just my favorite pastrami and the matzo ball soup. I mean, that's just it right there. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> But uh, what was I going to say? So DopeyCon, we're going to do it again. I think we're going to do it the first week in October in Manhattan. And uh, it's it's the coolest thing. Because, I mean, last year, people flew in from um, from New Zealand, from England, from California, from Seattle. And, and it's like, I'll tell you this. Like, I, I've been doing these Zooms every week in conjuncture with a sponsor of our show. And, uh, and our community is very beautiful. And I also do a Zoom with with patreon like I, I have a patreon thing and people subscribe to it to support the show and we do a zoom every month and it's like hanging out with friends at this point in the beginning it was weird and it was cool and like i was famous for a second in my mind going on the zoom you know uh but now it's totally like seeing friends and, and we're all in it together and it's like it, it's become a real thing you know out of uh, a joke which is the coolest thing, which goes to show that you can manifest anything just by doing. Right. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Mr. Anderson, you got anything else? Good, sir. I'll tell you what, Dave, this has been just an absolute pleasure, man. This is uh, Jason's been telling me about you and, and I am just thrilled that you came on. This is fun. Congratulations, man, on everything that you're doing. I think it's wonderful. Congratulations on your sobriety. Man, just Thank just you. just keep it up, brother. Keep it up, because like I keep telling Jason, it's you guys, it's it's the younger guys that are going to take this thing and and run with it, you know. And and you got you're the generation that's going to be helping more and more people here. And uh, God, I just wish I could be around long enough to 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 see the end result. But you guys run with it, man. That's all I can say. Well, I. I I appreciate you calling me young. That's like the highlight of, of this, of this meeting, <laughs> this, this zoom. Um, but no, I mean, like, honestly, most importantly for me with this whole thing, and this is how self-centered I am. It's not about for me. I mean, like my recovery is all about helping the next guy. My recovery is all about connecting and, 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 and trying to help anybody I can that, that wants to get sober in any way that I can help them. But dopey is a, is just me doing what I've always wanted to do. It's like crazy obsessive love. It's like having a band. It's what I always wanted to do is to have an enter as have a talk show. I used to do a talk show, Flint, at Katz's called The Last Jewish Waiter. And it was about a waiter <laughs> who hates waiting tables and he wants to have a talk show. So he does the talk show while he waits tables. <laughs> you should check it out. It's pretty, it's, 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 it's almost I want to see that. I want to check that out. Absolutely. 
but this is all I do. I, I, every week I do. I mean, I'm up to episode 407 this week. Oh, and, uh, and, and I honestly love it. Like I just still, I really love it. It's not, it's not anything besides a thrill for me. So right. thank you guys. I mean, I really appreciate coming on, but it's like that. It's like thrilling for me. The whole, the whole thing. You're the best Dave. Thanks, man. Thank you, brother. I love Thanks, you. Flint. I appreciate you guys. Love you too. Right on. If you or a loved one is struggling with addiction, please call Parents and Addicts in Need at 559-579-1551 or check us out online at painnonprofit.org. Follow us on social media at Pain Nonprofit. Please subscribe to the podcast and share with others wherever you get podcasts and on YouTube. To donate, please click the link in the description and help us save more lives gripped by addiction. This podcast contains the views and opinions of hosts and their guests to the show. The content here should not be taken as medical advice. The content here is for informational purposes only. And because each person is sharing their unique perspective, please consult your healthcare professional for any medical questions. Views and opinions expressed in the podcast and website are our own and do not represent that of our places of work. While we make every effort to ensure that the information we are sharing is accurate, we welcome any comments, suggestions, or correction of errors. Privacy is of the utmost importance to us. For those wishing anonymity, people, places, and scenarios mentioned in the podcast have been changed to protect confidentiality at the request of certain guests. This website or podcast should not be used in any legal capacity whatsoever, including but not limited to establishing standard of care in a legal sense or as a basis for expert witness testimony. No guarantee is given regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on the podcast or website. In no way does listening, reading, emailing, or interacting on social media with their content establish a doctor-patient relationship. If you find any errors in any of the content of this podcast or blogs, please send a message through the contact page.